Good morning, saints. Good morning. Good morning. We want to thank the Lord for all that he has done for us this week. Amen. Thank him for how he has been a shelter in the time of storm. We thank him for the... Testing, testing, testing. We thank him for those of you that have been thinking of us here at Meet Ministry to bless the Lord with your offerings. We thank you for your prayers. We thank you for your presence. We thank you that God has seen fit to blow his breath into your body as well as ours to make us to be here today. And so we thank him and those, there are many ways. We thank him for the, the funds that uh, are given. We have different ways of giving. If you can't, if you don't have an a envelope that you gave, you can always go on the website. And we have different, uh, what do they call them, uh, different methods of online. You know, I'm a, I guess I'm a baby boomer, so I'm not familiar. You know, I don't get off into the different, uh, what do you call the platforms. But anyway, I promised myself that I was going to come up on higher grounds in 2024. I started, and so I'm at the end, So, but nevertheless. But we want to take the uh, opportunity now to praise God with his Hebrew names. We've come to the end of the year, and as we look at the different names, this year we've looked at Jesus' Hebrew names. And last year, we looked at God's, and by God's grace, next year, we will look at the Holy Spirit's name. But today, I want to just reinforce where we started last week. We talked about Jesus' name as being the Prince of Peace. And you know, this is the time of year that you hear many different names, but what name do you hear most of all? in December. What would you think of his Hebrew name uh, in this uh, month? The who? Messiah. The Messiah, right? Because everybody is talking about the Messiah. But there are different uh, titles for Jesus. And I think of, even when we talk about the Messiah, there are Titles such as, he is the Lord of Lords, he's the master, he is king of kings, he is ruler, and of course, he is prince. Now, last week I talked about what is a prince, what is the meaning of the prince, and I gave you a, a uh, meaning, one meaning, but I'm going to give you two more, that the meaning of prince could be, of course, the son of a king, right? And we looked at that last week. We could look at a genetic, genetic term, and it could mean a ruler or a leader. That's what Jesus is. And then he can be called a king, right? But I want to look at another name. He's also called the Messiah, and that's what he's known as, uh, in December, he is called the Messiah, the Prince, and you can find that in John chapter 4. You can find the Prince of Princes, and we look at that in Daniel chapter 8, verse 25. And then he is called the Prince of the Kings of Earth, and that's in Revelation chapter 1. But you know what? Uh, there is a, another Prince that I want you to be aware of. And who is that? Satan. Because he's called the prince of what? Of this world or the prince of the air, right? So I want you to think of which prince do, can give you peace? Only Jesus. So choose whom you will serve this day. That's what, who says that? Joshua. Joshua. Chapter 24, verse 15. Why? Because we know that he is the mighty God. 
And uh, Philippians 4, 7 says he is the peace of God. What will he do? He will keep your hearts and your minds through who? Christ Jesus. So what am I saying? I want to encourage you to remember the Messiah, the Prince of Peace, who is the only one that can give you peace that passes all human understanding. Because in these days and times, if you don't have the Prince of Peace, you're going to be in trouble. There's a lot of things going on today. And so we need him to be in our hearts and our minds this day. May God bless you as you worship the Messiah, the Prince of Peace. And if you would like a marker, we have uh, bookmarkers to uh, encourage you to remember the name, those of you that would like to. Well, it has all of Jesus' names on the Good morning to everyone. Good morning. The faces here. Let me just say, could you just introduce yourself to us, my friend? Um, my name is Arthur Mims. Arthur Mims. I know, I know some Mims. Yeah, where are you from, brother? Beth, uh, Bethel Springs. Bethel Springs. Well, Not original. Uh, uh, originally, well, we're from Colorado, but we just moved here to Bethel Springs. Originally from Georgia. From Georgia. That's all right. Mims. So you transitioning? Yes. Okay. And Colette Mims as well. Colette Mims. I watch you on from what is it from? You say you stalk me. I know. <laughs> I watch your wife and yourself. I watch in um, Rico Hill on Friday evening still uh, from oh. um, health to sickness and there's some sickness that's to right. health. That's right. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a whoa. Oh, Stanley Mims. I know. He's from Georgia. My pleasure. Thank God for our health guests in here. You are still surviving, thriving, right? A amen. 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 It's good to be back in the house of the Lord. And thank all of our families. I'm going to have another word of prayer. We're going to get right into the word of God. I'm going to kneel. You can just bow your heads, okay? I'm going to pray. Father God in heaven, we come once again into thy presence. We thank you for your words of life this morning. Now, Lord, as we enter to this phase... In the name of Jesus, we ask for the guidance of the Holy Spirit to give us understanding, the application, and the grace to receive and the power to walk therein. Let your angels be in the midst of us, beating back the force of darkness, seen and unseen, to distract us from hearing your, you speak. Thank you for all our families here, those online. Now, Lord, you speak. Your servants will have ears to hear, and you grant us the power to walk in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 We're going to continue our study on the Laodicea. We're in part three. And those, <clears throat> those who are not here, you can also access this on YouTube. So I'm going to give a handout to everyone so you can follow suit. So I won't lose you in the discussion. And as, as Donald is passing those out, I'd like to make a statement and see what you think about it. The chapter in a book. A chapter in a book is not the same as the book. Can I repeat what I just said? Uh, what practical lesson can we draw from that statement? The chapter in a book is not the same as the book. Yes, sir. You can't just focus on one piece of something. You have to take the whole thing to okay. fully get the benefit. Okay, good. Anyone else having a thought? The chapter in the book is not the same as the book. Now, do you have chapters in your lives? Yes. Oh, yes. And God is writing the book. 
So that chapter in the book might not be a good chapter. Hello? Do you understand that? Yes. It might start off rough. You know, I go back when I was young. I remember I used to like to read comic books. Comic books. And I like to read Western books. And one of my favorite Western was a Long Ranger. Folks like that. And I read the comic book. In the beginning, we see that he's in a jam. He's in a jam. So I put the book down. I think about it. I said, no, nah, I'm not going to continue that chapter. I'm going to go to the end of the book. <laughs> and I find out at the end of the book, he wins in the end. Now, <clears throat> you can't skip chapters in your life. But I tell you what, who knows the end of your book? It's very important to understand that when you trace the hand of God, you had to trace him from the time you was conceived in your mother's womb, the time you began to crawl, walk, and run. And everything that happens in our life today already was in God's mind. Every mistake, every disappointment, every rejection, he knew that already. And once we understand to know God and love God, we know he has the whole book put together. There's no chapter in your life that he's not aware of, and he has not planned a wonderful end. Amen. Amen. So let's go through the chapters, understanding that God is navigating us. Is that right? Amen. So, message to the Laodicea. And we're on that third section. A spiritual temperature change, which we been talking about a temperature change. We find a needed change in temperature, lukewarm Christian. You see that on the front part of your sheet. So everything I'm putting up here is on your sheet. That's on the first part. So some of these things I don't have to go verbatim because time is of essence. I'm just going to condense. Are you with me? That's why I put the notes in your hand. Here, there's a statement you'll see spewing out. To those who are indifferent at this time, at this time Christ's warning is, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, according to Revelation 3, <clears throat> 16. And from a book some might be familiar with, some might not be, volume 6 of the testimony, 4-8. It says here, the figure of spewing out of his mouth means that he cannot offer up our prayers or our expressions of love to God. He cannot endorse our teaching of his word or our spiritual work in any wise. He cannot present our religious exercise with the request that grace be given you. Very important to understand that, the spewing out. It further says, what is my spiritual temperature, hot or cold? Mm -hmm. Revelation 3, 14, 21. Now, last time I was here at the very beginning, we somewhat dealt with a definition. Spiritual sickness, God's church, we are suffering from a serious spiritual sickness, which is called what? Laodiosis. Mm -hmm. That word osis, a suffix occurring in the nouns that denotes action, condition, or state, hypnosis, leukocytosis, Osmosis, disorders, sclerosis, neurofibromatosis, tuberculosis, condition, laodiosis. That's God's church. Now, laodicea is defined as people judge. That's what laodicea means. People judge. Revelation 3, 14 and 20. To understand the deeper meaning of the word laodicea, and why Christ inspired his use in the context of Revelation 3, one must examine the Greek words from which is derived. Laos, meaning people. Dike, meaning principle, decision. People making decisions. Keep this in mind. 
We are his people making decisions. Huh? In other words, as Christ showed in verse 20, Laodiceans trust what? In their ability to rule themselves. That's on your sheet. You see it? I'm going to say that again. It's very important. Laodiceans trust in their ability to rule themselves, judging, designing matters to the exclusion of Christ's rule within his church. Exclusion of the word of God. Now, even though there might be those out there, those here may not be part of the, this movement, but no matter what, if you even if a Christian, whatever you faith you belong to, we have a tendency to want to govern our own selves. We all have a God complex. Now, what is a God complex? That we can handle it. We can make changes. We can solve problems. We're all born with that complex. We might be conscious or even not even conscious of the fact. You find yourself growing up. You find yourself you want to be in charge. You're going to be the greatest God complex. And that is in the DNA. No psychologist or any type of secular mental discipline can root that out of your heart. It takes something supernatural to do that. Supernatural. Supernatural. See, Revelation 3, 14, 20. God declares the condition. God has provided a divine remedy for our spiritual sickness. Now, the point is that Laodicea, problem is they do not recognize they have a problem. Did you, have, did you understand what I just said? How many of us in our individual walk with God, we see other folks as our problem? They got a problem. And that's why we react to that situation. They to see it don't recognize they have a problem. So, what, so I'm going to read Psalms 51, verse 1 through 3 with a mic. Psalms 51, verse 1 through 3. Psalms 51, verses 1 through 3. We must recognize that we have a problem in order for it to find a solution. Anybody have that for us? Psalms 51, verse 1 through 3. Psalms 51, verse 1 through 3. Mm -hmm. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Mm -hmm. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Amen. Acknowledge. It's on the back of the first page. We're going to back of the first page. Now, the three divine remedies for this problem. We talked about a couple weeks ago, gold tried in the fire. Anybody remember what gold tried in the fire is? Gold tried in the fire. Anybody have a clue what it is? Faith, Faith and, love. and love. Amen. Then we talked about ISAF. Anybody know what the ISAF? Holy Spirit has a part in that, definitely. Open our eyes, that, anoint those eyes. We need spi spiritual discernment. We need that. And this morning, we want to look at that third remedy, white raiment. On your sheet there, you'll see there are passages of scriptures which you're not going to go through, but they are there representing that role. Righteousness deals with character, Christ's character. All that is on your sheet for your meditation on, all right? Now, statement. Jesus also prescribed that the Laodiceans should purchase white garments to clothe the shame of their nakedness. White garments are prominent in Revelation. and They are illustrative of an important idea. Early in the letter to Sardis, Jesus commended a few that who had white garments in Revelation chapter 3, verse 4. And he added that those who overcome 
will be clothed in white garments, according to Revelation 3, 5. Later, we see that the 24 elders around the throne are clothed in white garments, white garments. These are the scriptures you can reflect on, all right? Further, it says the armies in Revelation chapter 19, verse 14 says, the armies which were in heaven follow him upon white horses, clothed in white linen, white and clean. The bride of Christ is clothed in fine, bright, clean linen. And that linen is described as the righteous acts of the saints, according to Revelation 19, 8. Just giving you some clarity of this white raiment. Then it further says, if the Laodiceans were to buy righteous acts from Jesus, then it would, be, it would seem a similar prescription for buying gold refined with fire. How do we buy this righteousness? The Laodiceans should trade in their own selfish pursuits, <laughs> giving themselves to God in order to gain not positional righteousness. They already have when God received you, but Righteous deeds for which they will be great with reward. Righteous deeds. Once we receive Christ, that mindset, then out of that righteousness is going to flow righteous deeds. There will be no debate as I was listening to the Sabbath school lesson and therefore individual work to be done for all the soul. That's going to come automatically. Hello? Automatically. That we're going to win souls for Christ. It goes further. So if white represent righteousness, we have the answer to our question of how we can be clothed in white. This is what Romans 13, 14. Now, I read this text many times, but, it, you know, I read a statement in a book called Mount of Blessing. It says, familiar truths, familiar truths will break forth with greater light, greater understanding. Familiar truths. This is what it says. Now, I'm going to go back. So if white represents righteousness, we have the answer to our question of how we can be clothed in white. Did you hear that? We have an answer how we can be clothed in white. That's what it says. Put ye on the Lord Jesus and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. That's Romans 13, 14. It says put on what? Put on Jesus. Keep that in mind. How we do that? Keep that in mind. When we have put on the Lord Jesus, when we are cooperating with the indwelling Holy Spirit ministry, then there is no room for the flesh, our capacity to enjoy sin is decreased until we quite naturally find ourselves living as holy people. That's going to become more clear and clear. Hmm? Our capacity to enjoy sin decrease until we quite naturally find ourselves living as holy people. This is the only way to overcome sin. The overcomers are clothed in white. They have access to the heavenly places. This is why their names are in the book of life. Is that air cool on anyone? I cough you. The air. Did y'all feel cool air over there? All right. You all right, Javez? You good? Okay. Let me repeat. This is why their names are in the book of life. And why they may stand before the Father and his angels and be acknowledged as sons and daughters of the highest God. High is God. Mm -hmm. How do we live righteously? Not by trying to do it in my own strength. John 15, 5 said, without Christ, you can do nothing. But by putting on Christ, by clothing myself with the Lord, my righteousness. He is my righteousness. I simply clothe myself with him. Clothe. It come out clear. In a wonderful book called Mount of Blessing. Read that out loud. What does that say real quick? We read what?
It's that simple. And that's simple. Simple statement. We receive righteousness by receiving who? Very important. Then I have to ask myself, have I received them? Or do I know how that takes place? Keep, keep with me now. So righteousness is embodied in Christ. And we receive righteousness by receiving Christ. That's so how we close. Are you following me so far? All right. Hmm? In John 1, verse 1, turn your Bibles there. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was what? And the Word was God. In verse 14, and the Word became flesh. Please get this. Now, how do we receive this righteousness? By receiving who? The word. Christ is the word. When we receive the word, the Bible says the word was made flesh. It was manifested. Now, when I receive the word into my life, according to that scripture, is that word going to become flesh? Y'all staring at me. I'm going to say it again. Yes. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh. And then you read in other places where it says the mystery of God is what? According to Colossians, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So therefore, if I receive this word in me, that word becomes flesh. That means I become the very thoughts of God. Hmm? Hebrews 1.3 said Christ was express image of God. Back in Genesis, God said he created man in his image. He created man with the capacity to reflect his very thoughts. Now, Oh, go ahead. Get shaking. Say, how are we going to do this? Because this movement that God has put you in is not a denomination. It's a movement. It's a movement. And it has a divine purpose. We read in the book of Revelation. The movement is designed to produce a body of people that will completely reflect the very heart and mind of God that would never see death. Ooh. Did you hear what I'm saying? Show me another movement like that. But then trust with these truths. People say, well, I'm trying. I'm, I'm, I'm obeying God. No. There's no trying situation. It's ordained. God had ordained that there would be a people before the close of time, according to Revelation, hmm, will have that seal Perfectly reflecting his character. We'll see this. Keep this in mind. So if I receive the word of God in me, it's not going to be like a boom. But if that word is in me, that sanctified walk. The Bible says the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I look down here. When I hear the word, listen for me. When I hear the word, the word is clear. As I share with my wife over, we got to understand this. When the word comes to us, the word, don't question Step on that word. Another word comes, step on that word. And the more you step on God's word, it lightens your path. It removes the dark places in your mind. It becomes more clear, more perceptive and discerning. And you will see through different lens with people. No matter what they do to you, what they say to you. You have the very mind of God. I share with my wife. I said, Christ, the word of God said, Christ never defended himself. He took accusation, insults, and he demonstrated what we always say, humility under power. Amen. He sit there while they were just ran around, and he was just praying. said, Lord, you just keep me in yourself because I'm going to be quick to listen but slow to speak. Because on the other end, there's a soul 
They know not what they're doing. Mm. <laughs> you, ain't get, you ain't get what I'm saying, folks. It's the fact, it was up this morning, it was up. when we are in confrontation and contention, caught only, only by pride come contention. All contention can be resolved with humility, power, under control. Amen. When you know you can speak words to put somebody in their place, cut them up. Because you don't know how to use a sword. Just like Peter. There in that garden when Judas betrayed Jesus. You remember that? I said this over and over. Like one of my sons said, he sh shared this story with me and I share it with you all the time. They talked about that preacher always preaching the same message over and over, Brother Mims. Preacher preached every Sabbath, same message. The people got tired of hearing the same message. Said, Preacher, what are you going to teach us some new stuff? He said, when I see a change in your life. Whoo. That's what I'm, I walk up and down this campus every day. I see folks, I'm still looking for some changes. I'm not going to stop preaching this theme until I go into my Christ like grave or be translated. Amen. We find the word only by pride. When they came to get Jesus, see Peter carried two swords with him. Even doing missionary work. -hoo 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 -hoo. <laughs> Judas was a gospel medical missionary. Matthew 10. They all receive the Holy Ghost. Are you following me? You know, you say, man, that don't sound right. You see, Carol, Jesus don't see what we see. He saw what Peter will become. Amen. <laughs> when we're going back and forth with people, trying to put them in a place, we do not see what God is setting up through circumstances. We don't see through the eyes of God, what that person will become with us cooperate with God and allow God to love them through us. Amen. The word became flesh. Became flesh. Became flesh. This is how it becomes flesh. Abiding. John 15, 1 through 10. Christ said, if you abide in me, my word abide in you. You ask what you will and it will be done. So the abiding in Christ, that's the word, the word abiding in you. So we don't go to God with our own words. You don't hear our words. Hear the words of God, of Jesus. So if the word is in me and Christ is in me, therefore I'm not speaking my words. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Yeah. One person. But do we understand the fact that God wants to shape us, mold us, until we come like Jesus Christ. Philippians 2 5, let this mind be in you. God wants to get us to the place that we're thinking after his own thoughts. God wants to get us to the place that we're not dealing, we're not speaking our own words. This Bible here is the very thoughts of God. They are supernatural. We're dealing with a DNA problem because we have been ingrained from our whole life from the conception up to point. But God says, it's nothing too hard for me, Jackson. I can change it. But God has given us a free will. Do you want it? Do I want it? Yes, I want this. Look at the world. It's already wrecking old, groping in darkness. 2024 coming up. Folks are now jacking for presidency and et cetera. Presenting all the solution, we as a church have been entrusted. We are the depositors of God's work. Now every uncouth thing that's coming among us, then we rationalize it. Situational ethics. Like my wife said, we know we, we're baby boomers, and we now we know the millennials, we know everybody is very technical, but we are all right. But see, God is not situational. See, God's word does not change. It's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So no matter, technology is changing, but God's word doesn't change. Amen. Yeah, that richest man on this earth, what's his name? That's right. Now he want to put forth Blake AI. 
I'll be sure that even though they're going to maybe have an AI folks taking doctors' places, man. What do you think about that? Hmm? See, God said man sort of many inventions. I mean, God get wisdom now. Don't get me wrong. They get wisdom. But God has given us the word of God, and we can stand firm on that. Let's get on down here. We need to know this white raiment here. Now, when we abide in Christ, there are four great incentives for abiding in Christ, for seeking the abiding experience. Number one, we will stop sinning. We will stop sinning. Number two, we will bring forth fruit in John 15. We will bring forth those fruit. Number three, we will enjoy success in our prayer life. And number four, we will not be ashamed at his coming. We will not say rocks fall on us. We say, hey, this is he who we waited for. We'll be praising him. Are you listening to me? These are the incentives for abiding in Christ. Why? It says, this covering the robe of his own righteousness, this robe woven in the loom of heaven, has, now you can flip your page, you'll see what I just read there. Then I'm, that's the second page on the back of that second page. So I won't lose you on the pages here, huh? Yeah. So you see at the bottom of that third page, Okay, you see fine here. This robe, woman in the loom of heaven, has in it not one thread of human devising. Amen. Christ in his humanity wrought out a perfect character. And, the, and this character he offers to impart to us. Isaiah 64, 6 says, all of our righteousness are as what? Filthy rags. As filthy rags. All of our righteousness as filthy rags. Everything that we ourselves can do is defiled by sin. But the Son of God was manifested to take away our sins, and in Him is no sin. And sin is defined to be the transgression of the law, according to 1 John 3, 5, 4. Filthy rags. You want to remove those filthy rags. And the Holy Spirit can open the door of this stony heart of ours. And we can be closed. Look at Isaiah 61, 10. You see that Isaiah 61, 10. Go to your Bible and let's read it so you can know what it says. Go to your word. That's right underneath, but... I want you to read the scripture. Somebody read Isaiah 61.10 for me. Read the scripture for me. We're almost there. This robe, this white raiment. Anybody like to read it? Just raise your hand. We got a mic. Oh, okay. I will greatly rejoice Hold in the Lord. Hold on a minute. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he have clothed me with the garments of salvation. Mm -hmm. He have covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decked himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorned herself with her jewels. Mm -hmm. That's just who clothes us? Christ. Christ clothes us. It's right on your sheet there. Christ. Revelation chapter 3, 20. It says here that we find that Christ. Let's go back. Robe of righteousness. Let's go on down here where it says here, our high calling. Our high calling. You, some of my folks seen this over and over, but this is where it comes from. Our high calling. Philippians chapter 3, 13 and 14. Paul said, I forget those things behind and press for those things before me. That's verse 13. Verse 14 said, I press for, I, for the mark. The mark of God. The high calling. High calling. Calling, we find God likeness. Let's read this together. What does it say? Higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's idea for His children. Godliness, God likeness, is the goal to be reached. That's a high calling. Hmm? High calling. God likeness. God likeness. Then on your sheet, you'll see it says the righteousness is holiness, likeness to God, and God is love. 
1 John 4, 16. It is conformity to the law of God. For all thy commandments are righteousness. Psalms 119, 172. And love is the fulfilling of the law. You know, when people say, you know, you ask, it, you know, do you love God? I say, I love God. Now, how, how can you test, or how can you prove that they love God? God said, if you love me, you're going to keep my what? So anybody out there say they love God, you cannot sidestep the commandment of God because love automatically is going to embrace the law of God. Those ten precepts plus the natural law, eight laws. All those is laws if you love them. So the first thing is, is establish a love affair with God. Say, Lord, I need that love. When that love comes in my life, I don't have no problem of walking in your law. Hmm? It's just to be common denominator. It says righteousness is love. And love is the light and life of God. God is love. And that love becomes flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. That love becomes flesh in the person of you and I, if we receive Christ. We become love on two feet, love with two hands, love with two eyes, love with ears open, love from above. No debate, no discussion, no committee. Do you love God? That's the bottom line, bottom line. And you read Romans 8, 1 through 10, <clears throat> reflect on that. It speaks of the fact that the spirit of Christ is in me because there's only two spirits. Spirit of God or spirit of Aristotle. Contending for your life. Contending. John 10, 10 tells him that. The thief come to steal, rob, and kill. Christ said, I come to give you life and life more abundant. Only two powers. Not your wife, not your husband, not your children, not your workers. Not your enemies, those not your enemies. Are you listening to me? Then you say, well, if I can get rid of that enemy, I'll be all right. Then you need to get rid of yourself. Because <laughs> we're going to say, you are the worst enemy. Worst enemy. Christ in me, because of righteousness, shared those with you. Now listen to this as we come on down to the end. Christ Perfect humanity is the, now listen to this, is the same that we may have through connection with Christ. That's at the bottom of the page. As God, Christ could not be tempted anymore, you see that? Anymore than he was, as God, Christ could not be tempted any more than he was, not tempted from his allegiance in heaven. But as Christ humbled himself to our nature, this is amazing. He did not take the nature of angels. He took the nature of human being. You find deity, angels, man, beasts. That's condescension. Are you following me? He could be tempted. You see, but as Christ humbled himself to our nature, he could be tempted. As God, God cannot be tempted. You agree with that? So therefore, he had to take on our nature to be an example. Then it goes on and says, he had not taken on him even the nature of the angels, but humanity. Perfectly identical with our own nature, except without sin. So we have a friend in heaven who we can really identify with, who tried to wind press along, who know what it means to be abandoned, to know what it means to be rejected, to know what it means to be falsely accused. I share with my wife, there's not one experience we have, trauma that we have, that Christ has not experienced himself. Hmm? We got to think in light of eternity, 
that will. You, you're talking about personal witness. One of the greatest witnesses when somebody's just railing and fussing at you and you sitting there with tears in your eyes and they think it's tears for yourself, it's tears for them for they know what they say. But when you continue to contend and go word for word, you're not doing nothing but giving more fuel to the devil Amen. to wipe out both of you all. Amen. You have to have this connection. You have to have it. Verily, verily, I say to you, Christ continued, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he also do. The Savior was deeply anxious for his disciples to understand for what purpose his divinity was united with humanity. He came to the world to display the glory of God, that man might be uplifted by his restoring power. God was manifested in him that he might be manifested in them. Jesus revealed no, listen now, Jesus revealed no qualities and exercised no powers that men and women may not have through faith in him. Mm -hmm. If that don't speak hope to you and I, nothing, it says on, his perfect humanity is that which all his followers may possess if they what? Be in subjection to as he will. Come from a wonderful book that I recommend the world to read it, Desire Agent. All Christ Rest of us is submission, and he will give us the power. Some closing thought. Dwight Lyman Moody made this statement. God sends no one away empty except those who are full of themselves. So this morning, God don't want to send nobody empty. The only reason you're going to go empty, you're full of yourself. Let me give you a statement here to show you what I'm talking about. Come from a book called Early Writings. My duty to humble myself. Truth, saving truth, must be given to the starving people who are in darkness. I saw that many prayed for God to humble them. But if God should answer their prayers, Larry, it will be by terrible, it will be by terrible things in righteousness. Do y'all hear that? You know what that means? That means, Sister Wanda, if I do not choose to humble myself, then God would do it. It would be terrible. You might not survive it. So if you don't remember anything I said, don't ask God to humble you. Don't walk around, humble me, Lord, humble me. You have the power of choice. Say, Lord, I submit myself to your hand. I consent for you to take control of this life. Hmm? You give, I mean, here you're giving the creator of heaven permission to take control of your life, which already belongs to him. Now, you got children, you got one, just think, you know, that little girl grew up living in your house, you knock on the door, you got to ask her permission to come into your house, and she's just a child. Are you listening to what I'm saying? That's love itself when God gives you the opportunity to choose to let him into his own house. As Dr. Play, God made this body a temple. This is God. But we got to give him permission, Doc, to come into this temple. That's already his. That is a manifestation of God's love for you and I. Amen. It's our duty to humble ourselves. It says it was their duty to humble themselves. I saw that if self-exaltation in any. Now, when we read about self-exaltation, we go to Lucifer. But we do not see that when we put forth our own opinions, that's a self-exaltation. Put their own exaction on people, behavior, and impugning motives. We don't know the heart. We don't know it. That's why we 
I need to let God say, search this heart of mine. Know my thoughts. See, is that in wickedness? I saw that if self-exaltation was suffered to come in, it will surely lead souls astray. If not overcome, it will prove one of it says they're ruined. It says not. It says it is my duty to humble myself. Hmm? When one begins to get lifted up in his own eyes and thinks he can do something, the spirit of God is withdrawn. I'm going to say that again. It says here, lift up in his own eyes and think he can do something. The spirit of God is withdrawn. And he goes on in his own strength until he is overthrown. Because their sins shall find you out. I saw that one saying, if he or she were right, could move, could move the arm of God. Woo. One saying, Christian, you hear me back there? <laughs> if one saying, if one saying, if they were right, could move the strong arm of God. We got many saints. In family, if you in a family, you, things are not going good. Be that one saint in the family. In the church, be that one saint. In the ministry, be that one saint. You know, I was down and I was on a trip. I want to get too clear because the world will be watching. But I was talking to an individual. And they was in a very precarious family situation, traumatic situation for years and years. Family, marriage. And it was not emotionally, spiritually healthy. So definitely they want a way out. So they, they was planning to separate. So they wanted to talk with me. And I'm quite sure that they didn't expect what the Lord had to say through me to them. I said, now, if the life is not in jeopardy, you know, abuse, physical abuse, then even though that's biblical principle, you can separate. That doesn't mean you have to div you divorce. You separate. You get into a safe place. And the person said, well, they're not changing. And I hear that a lot. Generally, not changing. I said, now, when you read in 1 Corinthians, you read in chapter 7, you find the, the believer, unbeliever, if the believer want to leave, leave. But the believer don't take that position. They recognize that they're an instrument for the saving of that soul. Amen. Now, let me ask you a question. I asked before, as we come on down. Now, what are the fruits from a tree for? When an apple tree, fig tree, pear tree produce fruit, what are they for? Somebody they for somebody else, doctor. They for somebody else. They for the person that is starving, hungry, and lacking spiritual nourishment. So you stay connected with Christ. You stay connected with Christ. As long as not jeopardize your life, you stay connected. And the fruit that God is going to bear through you is for the folk that are not in harmony with God. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you truly understand what I'm saying? Amen. You know, it's, it's like I heard where this person was sent to, to a country to be a missionary. Now, why God would send us Places to be missionary. What's the purpose of going to a place to be missionary? What was the purpose? Real quickly. To this word. Now, suppose you go there, Brother Larry, get to that place. Man, you become disgusted. You say, man, there's nobody over here. It's Christian, man. I got to leave. Then why were you there? What do you think about that, Sister Booker? If you missionary and you're there, that's right. You're there to what? To point them to Jesus. But you don't see maybe the whole place, even the church you're in, you don't see nothing. Because that's why people leave church, start their own little groups, because they don't see. Now, let me back up. We have really a misconception 
of the church. And we read that tares and wheat. Would you say so? Mm -hmm. Wise and foolish. Because that's what I used to be. I said, man, got in church and I walk in the church. People weren't dressing right, eating right, thinking right, smelling right, talking right. Preaching one, preaching right. So I said, man, this is, I'm going to start my own little thing. So most of we defected. Start our own little group. Then that group split. Then they start another group. Then that group split. Why? You cannot run from yourself. God said you ought to be the salt. You ought to be the light. Very important. Stay put because God got a plan for you. It goes on. It says here, be fruitful. It said, by your fruit, you shall be known. How do I know that I am in Christ? It's by my fruit. This is what it says here. What's in your suitcase? Hmm? Suitcase. These are fruit in that unconverted heart. Pride, self-ambition, jealousy, unforgiveness, hatred, argumentative, defensive, all-consuming yet never satisfying wants, small-minded and lopsided pursuits. That's in that ungenerated heart. Um, then you flip over there, you see as it goes on further. Know them by their what? Fruits. It says here, it goes on forgiven. Then it says, we got to be filled. Filled. These are the things that God want to produce in us. You see that on the sheet. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, fruit, faithfulness, gentleness. These are the precious fruit of the Spirit. Self-control. This is how I know I'm in Christ. This is how I know that I am preparing for that garment. Amen. Hmm? I don't have to go look through Google. It's in the Word of God. So, in conclusion, I have just one question to all of us. What's in your suitcase? Or in other words, what's in your heart? Matthew 15, 18, 20. Out of the abundance of heart, the mouth speak it. Hmm? Have I become empty so that I might be filled with Christ's likeness and a servant of Christ? That's what we got to ask ourselves. Several final statements. The Christian life, listen to this, is a battle and a march. But the victory to be gained is not won by human power. Hmm? Keep that in mind. The field of conflict is the domain of the heart. The battle which we have to fight, notice this. Some of us read this before, but listen to what it says. The greatest battle that was ever fought by man is the surrender of self to the will of God. The yielding of the heart to the sovereignty of love. The old nature, born of blood, and the will of the flesh cannot inherit the kingdom of God. The hereditary tendencies, the former habits, must be given up. And all God is asking us is what? Surrender. Lord, I give up. <laughs> Give you consent. Daniel 7, 9, he said, I beheld till the thrones were cast down. And the angel of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow. Thou hast a few names, God said in Revelation 3, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Spiritual lesson for my dear friends, the ermine. You see that? 
Told this story over and over, but this is what it got to be. Isn't that a cute little guy there, Carol? Seems like you want to take me as a pet, huh? <laughs> the hermit was a very pretty animal. Very expensive. They used to catch him for fur. His coat was expensive. The ermine was very elusive. They couldn't track him down with dogs anywhere. They had to find out where his abode, where he lived. When they found out where the ermine lived, they was able to do something. That's that little white guy there. Isn't he cute, ladies? Y'all like the little kitty, 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 cute. <laughs> but the ermine was in danger. So when they found out where the ermine lived, and when they knew that he was not there, they would go into his place and throw trash in it. Trash. Listen, now this is an animal that does not have a frontal lobe like you and I. They, throw, they just junk it up, junk it up. And when he come back, he go in, he would not go into that junky place to get his pretty coat messed up. He'll come back out and he's trapped. Are you listening to that? Hmm? That ermine would rather die than to get his coat Dirty. Did you get the story? Christ has prepared a garment for us. And the quizzes are on. We're going to come to a time in the near future. We're going to be faced with life and death. You and I do not get prepared on the final test, when the test is given. He allows quizzes now. He allows disappointment now. He allows resentment now. Anybody listen to me? Those are quizzes. They're ordained by God. Let's not spend time talking about the quizzes. Let's thank God for the quizzes and his grace to navigate us. For it says in Christ's object lesson 69, Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church when the character of Christ should be perfectly reproduced in his people. Then he will come to claim them as his own. In Revelation 41, and I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion. And with him, that 144,000, having his father's name written in their forehead. That law, like Isaiah 8, 16, the seal of God, the very thoughts of God. Those who come up to every point, stand every test or quiz, and overcome by God's grace. Be the price what it may, folk, have heeded the counsel of the true witness. And they will receive the latter rain that would empower them to go forth, gather their harvest, and thus be fitted for translation. Submitted and committed. For he is coming again for a church without spot about blemish, holy, Ephesians 5, 27. I want to be part of that, that great church. Amen. I want to be part of it. I want the Holy Spirit to just convict me and open the door of this heart of mine because it's decision time. And this should be our prayer, folks. Lord, please remove my stony heart, according to Ezekiel 20. And give me one that has the capacity for your spirit. Please enter me a pride. Pardon my sins. And fill me with your presence. In Jesus' name. Amen. amen. I pray. If you don't remember one thing, that God, all he asks of you is a willing spirit. Say, Lord, come in. Take control and purge me. That's, that's John 15. Purge me. 
empty me of everything that's unlike you and fit me to spend eternity with me. If you heard the word of God, I know it's definitely my desire every day. And that that word will become flesh. You remember the Bible said, every man will not teach his neighbor, but he will know the Lord because they're going to see a manifestation in God's people. And your life give power to your words. See, we, can, we can preach, teach. Nothing wrong with that. We, we glory in one another's teaching. But it's the life that's behind those words. And I was telling one of my young worker, I said, character, you know what type of character you are when nobody is, is looking at you. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's when characters manifest. When nobody knows anything about you. Mm -hmm. You know, final thought, I remember uh, I have a P.O. box in another city where we have another piece of property. And I went there on Sunday to check my mail and I want to mail a letter. I have no stamps. I had a coin machine. So I put a quarter in that machine. And that machine just, <laughs> for those BC who've been to Las Vegas, you know what I'm talking about. That coin machine poured out about 20 some dollars. When you are in self-supporting ministry, <laughs> every dollar is very important. So I got a bag, took all those coins, put them in a the bag, tied it up. I did not put down, this is from John Doe. I put it in the tray there, so they put it in. Character. When nobody know it and see you. You don't have to toot your horn. Mm -hmm. They would know. Am I making sense to somebody in here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any thought before I close out? Doc. Someone put it differently. They said, the secret to being a Christian is to be a Christian in, in secret. secret. Come on now. I like that. Does everybody understand that? Very important. May God be with us through these days, this hour. Reflect on some of these things we talked about as we prepare. Brother Cobb. Concretize that statement earlier. Um, be the only saint. Or the, Say again. Be the one saint. Be the one saint. One saint. Can you concretize, elaborate that, please? That was back here. Said one saint can move. I guess they got me off off here. One saint doing right and moving on with God. Yeah, one saint doing right. That was from us. Yeah, well, remember the page. It's on your sheet here. Yeah. Now, one saint doing the right thing can move the arm of God. One saint doing it right. Now, can we get any examples of that in the Bible very quickly? Where one person, Daniel. huh? Daniel. Daniel was good. Mm -hmm. Joseph. Joseph was good. Mm -hmm. Moses. Moses. So that means if you're aligning yourself up with God, you have submitted and committed. It's the fifth page. Fifth page. What book could come from, Jack? So one saint, simply mean cops, if you, just say in a place like this, you need to see God moving this work forward. And then you got 30 other people in this place. Maybe a majority of them might not yet coming in line. What I read from that scripture, that if one person one person is in harmony with God, quarreling with God, 
he can move the situation for his good. I seen that. I seen that. Am I clear? One saint, man. One saint. I see you in one saint. Simply mean your life is truly hid in God. Your life is in harmony with God. Your life is pleasing to God. You can move the arm of God. In the home. That's why I mentioned that earlier. I mentioned that. If, like, this person in this home was just, it was just held in the house. And they were ready to parachute out. Not realize that God put them there to dispel the darkness. And if they wrestle with God in prayer, if their lives are being controlled by God, exhibiting the peace. And as I heard some of the Sabbath school, the fact to affirm so even a person who is wicked or just terrible, you still need to validate them by respecting them. You don't have to agree with folks to respect them. <clears throat> Hello? But when you said that, they're going back and forth, you're making all those ugly faces, shaking your head. You can't move the strong arm of God. When you know you are secured in Christ, that's the problem we have. We're not secure. We are insecure. We do not know who we are because we allow those people to define us, to affirm us with their statements. And if we have not been affirmed by Calvary Cross, by the very fact that God created you and I, and then we can trace the hand of God. And when you're in a situ contiguous situation like that, you got to go back. You got to be like David. You know, he had to encourage himself. One person who understands that and working in harmony with God, can move God's hand. He can change uh, the complexion of a ministry all around in a matter of two days. He can change a church. He can change your family. Even because that we pray for our children, and they don't listen. But if you're faithful, working in harmony with God, you can move arms with God, arms with God, in saving that boy. One, so go ahead. That's what I see, God. You understand me? Go ahead. Somebody go ahead. In the go. beginning, you were speaking about the word was made flesh yes, and dwelt among us, and that as we take in the word of God, he dwells within us. Amen. Now, in Sabbath school, we were talking about these points in which we are able to um, win our brethren that are in darkness. And so this is a point where New Agers... Um, they take that point that when God is in us, we become as gods. Mm. How would we help them to understand that that's not what that means? No, see, God created Adam in his image and his likeness, right? He's the creator. Adam became a very conduit for the grace of God to flow through. See, new ages take the fact that you become God. Mm -hmm. not, only, not only that, you heard of like... Uh, very well-known, famous doctor, J.K. He wrote a book. He wrote a book. Pantheism. Yes, yes, yes. Hmm? Yes. And then that God is in everything here. Then there was another lady. That's why some of us who study his health and don't understand the biblical principle, there's another person who ran with this concept, and now they juice and say that God is in the Jews. Oh, I've been 45 years. So New Ages is pantheism. Jesus, his word, in him, that means he became the expression of God. Now, God wants us to be expression of himself. Does that make you and I God? Hmm? No. Can we create anything? No. God said you cannot add one cubit to your height or one gray hair turn black. But God wants us to be reflectors. And that's the word of God. See, this word ready. Now, sister, okay. two thoughts cannot occupy the space in my brain. 
So whatever the groove has been developed in my brain from my life coming on up, we bring those thinking, thinking into our Christian experience. So those grooves, just like I said over, you see cows going up and down the pathway. You see, they make grooves. They don't make 10 grooves. They come down the same groove, right? So therefore, you got to override those grooves with the word of God. So when I override those grooves, and I can see it in my life, when I sit and see people in contention, you know, I don't, I don't get sweat under my armpits like I used to. I understand there's a greater battle being fought that the people who are in that battle don't understand that is the devil seeking to destroy both parties. Somebody, somebody got to be standing in the gap for that. That one saint. You ain't, you, you got to get what I'm saying. You're going to see that in your family. Go ahead, dog. You had something to say. Did I help a little bit, sis? We were talking about one person having power to move the arm of God. It brought to mind, to me, there was a war going on one day with Israel and mm. their enemy. Mm -hmm. And the leader of Israel, whose name was Joshua, looked and saw that as long as the sun was up, Israel was winning the battle. And that one person called on the name of the Lord. Amen. That he stayed the sun in the sky for about 24 hours. And the Bible said, never <laughs> had God hearkened Hello. to the voice of a man That's good. as he did that day. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Do you hear that? That's true. So what would I say to that statement? We could become that one man or one woman in the midst of the battle. That's good news to me. When everybody seems like going due north, we stay faithful. And God will. He even had to change the course of nature. He loved us so much, he would change the course of nature to save us. He'll dry up the rivers to save us. We got to get to know God, his love. That, and even with our health guests, as you go through this program, prayerfully consider them. All the things that's been done to you, they might not be comfortable, but they are necessary. Just count them as quiz. <laughs> but remember this. It's the mindset. Say, so what purpose am I here for? What do I want to experience? When you shift your focus off the things that seem to make you uncomfortable, because God's going to make us uncomfortable. He has to make us uncomfortable. He has to create circumstances so we don't feel comfortable, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't be satisfied. So we can call on him. So what I used to do, every time I had to drink that stuff, I call on God. God, help these taste buds. Even close this sinus so I won't smell it. You heard Yolanda, you know, she came here. Nobody go through that session. You know, we, 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 we all are touched with the feelings of your infirmities. That's why I don't come to us and say, can we take it away? No. <laughs> We already traded the wine press alone. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. May God. So this is quarter two. We have our health demonstration this afternoon at 430. I believe we do have lunch for our guests. We go to the manor house. Those who will tarry, we'll show you where that's located. Let us pray that God want to take these hearts of ours. Thank our friends for joining us online. We ask our friends who are joining us, invite somebody else to come and visit us online every Wednesday night, every Sabbath night, every Sabbath. And also, we'd like for you to even to uh, become members by just registering. So God bless you. Let us pray. Gracious Father in heaven, 
We thank you for that, what you are doing for us. Christ is not in Joseph's tomb. He's risen. Stand between the living and the dead. In the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, making the final atonement for my sins and every man and woman on the sound of my voice. High priest who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities, who knows every, every aspect of our lives. He came to give us life and life more abundantly. And I pray this morning we will once again make our calling and election sure by continuing to reach out to you to be clothed in your righteousness by giving you consent to take these hearts of ours because they belong to you. Keep them pure because we cannot. And save us in spite of our unchristlike weak selves. And raise us up into the pure atmosphere of heaven. That this rich current of love may flow through my soul, through our soul, to others. May the words, the meditation, application be acceptable in thy sight. Our Lord, our Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.